longtime professor of philosophy and, and also the art critic for the nation. And, and he um, has this argument that contemporary art sort of starts at the moment when we can't tell the difference between art and everything else. And his example is Andy Warhol's Brillo boxes. Andy Warhol made this thing that was just, they looked like a Safeway aisle. Um, did this in the early 60s. At that moment, you can't tell what's art and what's not because Andy Warhol before that was a commercial artist and he made it look exactly like those uh, boxes you see in the aisle of a grocery store. So what distinguishes one thing as art and what distinguishes another thing as, as not art um, becomes sort of a, a question of how is it positioned, how is it framed. So Ian's um, proliferation of games as this, games as that, um, it, was one way of sort of enumerating the different kind of ways you could think about what games are. If we don't just think of games as games, or we think of games as distributed work, games as religion, games as journalism, we, we bring different criteria to them. And what I heard all three of you talking about was actually criteria for deciding, is this a, is this a good game or not a good game? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, um, another way to put that kind of in art speak is that it's aesthetics. Um, it's to bring back to what Ian was asking Michael about at the beginning, isn't this just your aesthetic? And so if we think about it as aesthetics, what I found was quite striking in contrast to uh, the way a lot of artists have thought about uh, aesthetics, especially avant-garde artists, is that it, it seems like all three of you are interested in broadening games and making them uh, more participatory, more, like uh, broadening their appeal um, in many ways. And um, this is sort of an exact opposite to what a lot of avant-garde art has been. Uh, Vic Victor Shlotsky uh, was uh, the sort of theorist for the Russian formalists in the early 20th century, and he said that thing of, of, uh, of making something ordinary, he called that process automatization. Um, and he's saying this before computers, right? But he says automatization corrodes things. Clothing, furniture, one's wife, and one's fear of war. And so that a sense of life may be restored, that things may be felt, so that s stones may be made stony, there exists what we call art. And his point was that if you're actually going to do art, you want to make things the familiar things, unfamiliar. In fact, ostranenye means right. defamiliarization, making it. Uh, so I, I've just found this really striking because all of you seem to be arguing for an aesthetics that's exactly against what a lot of, uh, of avant-garde art has been about, <laughs> and whether you had sort of a comment on that. I actually deliberately tried not to, um, to promote one aesthetic over the other, particularly in terms of value. Like, I think if you look at the types of games that I was illustrating on that graph. There are many, many people that value the games on either side or in the middle. It's, it's not about where in the space you are in terms of value. Um, but what I do believe is true is that if something is expressive, it's much more capable of taking unique shapes because the inputs are unique and very varied. And so in that sense, I would definitely fall on the side of believing that the more expressive tools that a person has with what with whatever they're doing, the more it can take the shape of, of something unique and interesting. I mean, I, I think that there are many examples of, of games that I showed and games that I didn't show that I, I personally find ghastly. And you can make aesthetic judgments uh, from some aesthetic position while simultaneously admitting the existence of other things. So, you know, denying that there are these um, Farmville or gamification trends, for example, is, is sort of, well, it's nonsensical because they're clearly, they clearly exist. Um, but they also exist kind of in this ecosystem of games doing things, you know. Um, and that's not really, I don't think that's exactly an aesthetic position. It, it's more of a kind of media ecological position. In, like in, in, you know, the, the well, to... to to look at something and ask, what is it, um, and what do I think of it, um, requires that you first point to it and cast it as something, as as a game or as a, uh, as a you know, or as a kind of uh, religious practice or whatever it might be. Um, 
And so I'm interested in both of these, both of these questions, and I do have particular aesthetics. Um, but I think that they can, when, when we, we really have to, tr we have to be aware that, um, in order, in order for this sort of, um, expansion to happen in order for this cultural, um, tidal wave, uh, to arrive in which games are considered, um, important, which I really think is just a, a kind of, uh, fancy way of saying ordinary, then we've got to look at all the examples and we don't have to like all of them. Though. So I, I, I do think there's, there's something of a distinction to me between, between aesthetic judgment or aesthetic, um, creativity, the, adopting a particular aesthetic for, um, the creation of games and recognizing the, the broader ecosystem in and around games, uh, that includes, you know, for me, many examples that um, I find uh, lovely and, and wonderful and many that I find uh, atrocious. And I guess, you know, from my point of view, I don't feel like I was necessarily arguing for an aesthetic, but rather trying to say, you know, much like we could argue that film, film's unique way of producing meaning is cutting sequences of film together, um, that game's unique way of producing meaning is on this foundation of operational logics. Um, that doesn't mean that music doesn't contribute to the meaning of a film. It just means it's not that particular part, which is the thing that sets film apart. Although, you know, you, you, toward the end of your talk that you did, um, make the argument that having more operational logics available to us is, is desirable. Yeah, right? yeah, no, which yeah. is, but not necessarily by way of saying then each of those, when a game is the first one in a new logic, it is beautiful. Right. It wasn't really an aesthetic judgment. It was really about broadening the palette of expression that we mm -hmm. have. Right. But there is something, there is an aesthetic judgment in, in, in declaring that one of the first ways that you are going to practice that yourself is by introducing, uh, character, you know, richer, uh, inner lives and characters in a, in a platform that otherwise supports mostly movement and collision detection, graphical logics in your terms. I guess I could be accused of the same thing too. So, <laughs> so there's, there's like a slippage between these. It's like you can't, you know, you, you kind of can't escape making aesthetic judgments at some point. Sure. I mean, eventually, as any sort of artist or media maker of any sort, you decide where to invest your energy. And that is a judgment that is in part aesthetic. I'm just delighted we're, we're having this discussion here. I mean, <laughs> cultural practitioners of all sorts have these discussions, and uh, I think it's great we're having it, we're having it here. Do we have questions? I do. Um, so uh, I had uh, started this topic a bit earlier. Um, there was an interesting effect that was uh, characterized recently. There was a movie that came out where one of the characters was so realistically drawn that it, that test audiences were very uncomfortable. They had to dial it back from the CG point of view. And this was termed the uncanny valley. And my broader interpretation is, as various different kinds of algorithms and depictions and all the various elements that go into gaming, as each one of these continues to improve, we frequently talk about the ultimate goal, although we understand it's an asymptote, we'll never really get there, but we want to represent life somehow. But what we're not really aware of, and we're just beginning to understand that, is that there is that uncanny valley. You can get too close that makes people just too uncomfortable. You have to dial it back. And I think there is an element that we either are encroaching on or getting to the era where we encroach on, where we as participants in a game or observers of a narrative, we want to make sure that we still maintain that distance. So it, it, it kind of reminds me of the old uh, Disney experiment where they, they tried to animate a bouncing ball and they really tried to get to the physics of how does the ball squish and how does it hit the thing and so forth and they never quite got it right. So what they decided to do is just punt on the physics part. They got the ball going down almost to the floor and then coming up from the floor, but when you actually show the movie, it looks real. 
because our brains fill in the gap that's missing. So it feels to me like where we're going with this, where all this ties together is, as our technology improves, we're going to approach that uncanny valley, people are going to back off, and we're going to find that comfortable medium where we get close enough but not quite there, back off and let the player fill in the gaps that we don't see. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I guess, um, you know, something like six hours of someone sleeping is a very realistic film. Um, but it's really also, you know, an avant-garde experiment of interest mostly as an experiment. And I think that would be the same if we had some way of producing realistic behavior for any part of games, right? Like, A, we don't have it, but B, it would be of interest, uh, you know, with zero abstraction, mostly as an avant-garde experiment, I think. Yeah, I would. I would actually say that on the the game that I'm working on now, um, it is a it's a multiplayer experience where you encounter other players. Just they kind of approach you as if they were hiking over the hill. So you don't really. There's no lobby. There's no way of sort of deciding to play with someone. They're either playing and you encounter them, or you don't. And in play tests, it's often the case that players expect the other player to be an AI and are just like your AI is great. <laughs> Um, because we've removed a lot of the, um, I would say, a lot of the foreground that uh, characterizes the experience as being a game. It's just like you're there, and then they're there. And in a way, uh, by removing all of the infrastructure for social communication, uh, it's, a it's more social, because the only thing you can do is act, and your actions speak for you. If you walk together, you walk together. If you walk separately, you walk alone. And sort of the whole point of it is that we're trying to remove the the opportunity for people to treat each other as things, um, but also to remove the identifier of what that thing is, because it's not really our place to say. Um, I, I don't want to labor this so we can get to other questions, but I would, I would just point to the assumption uh, that technology is always getting better, and that we've internalized in in this industry and in kind of Silicon Valley high tech industry in general, that that what progress means is um, the improvement of what we what we already have and now. And one of the points that Noah is making is that we don't really know why we have the things that we have, and we have to ask ourselves difficult questions about the platforms um, that we've developed and invested in, in in many cases over decades. And in order to make progress in a different direction, it, it's it's hard. It, it may be intractable. So the idea that we just sort of wait around for things to get better and there's Moore's Law and that kind of just applies to everything um, is, uh, is a, it's, it's a, an assumption that we're, we make and that we should probably question. Cool. Uh, so I work at Zynga, which makes Ian's favorite game. I love it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, honestly. <laughs> yeah, we have a term sheet. I can show you. Um, <laughs> I'm sort of tall, so I'll hunch over. Um, but yeah, so I'm curious. Uh, there's this sort of ironic tension that runs up and down. And I think you know, Ian's noticed this. Um, you can't argue or, or or jockey for or fight for you know high culture while also disowning um, the sort of ordinary lower cultural um, foundation because there's no such thing as high culture unless there's a broader culture in general. So I think the discussion about extraordinary was really good earlier. Um, you know, about 20 years ago, if you were a, a hardcore gamer, um, it, it didn't matter what game you were playing, somebody who didn't play games wasn't going to call that game extraordinary because there wasn't an ordinary that they were playing. It was just sort of extra and you were a weirdo, you know? Um, but I think, I think now this explosion of social games especially, um, Farmville, for instance, you know, Zynga games are played by like one out of every ten people in the world now at this at this juncture. That that foundation of the ordinary allows for there to be an extraordinary, allows for that discourse, um, and it's it's sort of it's it's interesting to me because, for instance, uh, you know, I grew up in a younger generation. A lot of these games, which are famous and will always enjoy a place in gaming history, like Pong or or other games, like. I, I think these games are disgusting. They just depress me to look at it. They kill my spirit. 
Um, and yet, and yet, these are canonized by the same people who would vilify Farmville. And I think there's a real disjuncture here and a real misguidedness um, in the condemnation of this sort of democratization. The last thing I'll, I'll say before I just sort of uh, kick it over is I was on the I was on the plane and I, I met this young lady who talked to me about her mom who wakes up every morning and puts on sweatpants and then quote unquote farms. Um, and you know I, I, I almost I almost puked. I'll be honest, but. I also I also started to think about how a, ha a hardcore Halo player would feel if he heard this and looked down at his own sweatpants and was like, "Oh my God!" Suddenly, I'm I'm back to back with you know a, a middle-aged housewife, and we can both call ourselves gamers. I'm I'm personally more excited about Farmville um, and and these games suddenly making us all gamers and allowing for a discourse that would make one game important as opposed to just sort of a geeky thing to do. Yeah. I mean, I think this is right. You're right, with one exception. We we don't all become gamers. We stop. It stops making sense to talk about gamers. Is what happens. Um, a filmer. Right. Right. Filmer. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Yeah. I mean, that's. I, I I totally believe that the question of are you a gamer is just now it's meaningless. People will just say, "What kind of games do you play?" But there's still the category of film fanatic, and there may still be the category of, you know, passionate gamers. Right, but yeah, that's, we, we, that's we, the... we call them literate gamers, people that are really, really, like, you know, they're really well-read in games. Like, you know, not everybody that's a film goer, like, is really literate in the history of film. They just, you know, it's just not something everyone, you know, wants to do. But some people are, and, and you know, we love those people just as much as we love the person that just checks something out once. You don't need to hate. <laughs> you love. Uh, you all seem very uh, optimistic about the the uh, vast potential of games. Do any of you have any fear that due to profits uh, and similar forces that games may end up in some kind of a uh, cultural gutter? Profits? You mean like loss of profits? No, as in like, you know, ridiculously large profits uh, requiring ridiculously large companies with ridiculously large risks. You know, a, a world of Call of Duty clones. No, I mean, my, my team is like 13 people, so <laughs> I don't worry about that because it's, it's not my reality, and it doesn't have to be the reality anymore. I mean, people, any one of you could make a, a just an amazing game. I mean, you mean, any one of you could be making the next Minecraft. I just don't think that's a reality that we need to worry about. Or at least we could say we've won the shelf space battle, right? It yes. used to be like you could only reach game audiences by getting on physical shelves, yeah. and it's so nice to be past that. But there are other battles. There are other battles, but I mean, it'll always be the case that if it's valuable for people to express in the medium, then they will. I just well, you know. the risk of the cultural gutter uh, comes from paying attention to only. I mean, in, in my thinking, paying attention to only one possible application. But there's a flip side. There's a there's this double edged sword that when you when you adopt and embrace that expansion, then you get shit. You get a lot of stuff that you might not otherwise want to see and use, and it kind of goes both ways. Um, so, you know, to worry about the gutter is, um, while maintaining some essentially arbitrary high art aesthetic for games is perhaps no worse or better than embracing the idea of, um, you know, many, many possible uses, uh, most of which will be, um, relatively uninteresting. So I'm not sure that, that I would call my position optimistic so much as it, it, it allows for moments of optimism in <laughs> an otherwise just just ordinary situation you know we we don't if we were here talking about another medium um if we were talking about um um you know writing or landscaping or um or or or, or macrame or or fashion or whatever um you know then they would we we would have we would have been forced to recognize the sort of ordinariness and we would we would then be forced to find moments of novelty within it. And if we get to that point, then, then that's success. So we know that games are serious business. Um, lots of money is made in games. Uh, people feel that games are incredibly powerful culturally. Um, people are afraid of games. Grand Theft Auto. Uh, people feel that games are antisocial. Then we have this new generation of games, which seem pro-social. Right? Social games. Help your friend. Invite your friends. Send them gifts. But then the gaming community says, these aren't games. This is junk. This is tripe. 
But I think what's interesting to me about this whole conversation that we're having here is it's about broadening the kind of emotional context of games, right? It's, it's the reason why kind of old school games or hardcore games kind of get a bad rap in the broad culture is because they're antisocial. They're about killing each other and blowing things up, you know? Um, and I think that it's really interesting to me, the idea, well, let's create new tools, let's look for new operational logics, let, let's have a, a, a new framework for, for empathy about games. Um, to me, setting aside solo play games, because I think they're very, very intractable in a lot of ways until we have natural language processing or something, mm -hmm. other breakthrough. But just looking at social games, to me, the context is about creating meaningful uh, human interactions. And what's really interesting is, is with the kind of rise of Facebook and the fact that everybody's there all the time, and the tools that uh, you know, exploit uh, knowledge about people or who your friends are or the social graph in general, that the tools are widely available because the tools are bringing other human beings together. And the tools are creating meta-relationships between people that then generate uh, a sense of playing together, or a sense of reciprocity, or basically creating a, an emotional landscape which is a lot larger. Um, and so for me, it's an incredibly exciting time, and I think that um, you know, the tools that we're talking about, uh, that, that Noah's team and, and the rest of the folks at Santa Cruz uh, Game Lab are working on are really exciting, uh, but at the same time, I feel like maybe we just need to look more at how to bring people together and create game designs that are more intrinsically social um, than be overly consumed with creating an intense solo play experience um, that has really high technological requirements that are really related to AI, basically simulating humans in the machine. So, It's funny because when I was thinking through this talk and I was driving up with my husband, we were talking about what what is it about the single player experience that people really like? And you know when you go to the fair and you get like a really big mallet and you like slam the mallet down and then the machine goes bing and like shows you how strong you are? In a lot of ways I think what, what so, so, sort of single player game experiences provide you with is an opportunity to do that with your brain. You know, with your craft, with your your your, your ability to you know uh, predict the future and predict future events and plan, and that's a really awesome feeling. It's a it's an amazing feeling, and there are the the applications of it is as Ian was pointing out are, are massive. There's tons of things you can do with that technology, um, but that's often what it is. Um, should doesn't necessarily have to be a substitute for humanity. I, I think that's I think that's more a framing of the problem as if uh, we had to solve for simulating humanity rather than solving for the tools. And I think that's what I liked about Noah's introduction. Um, I certainly can't afford to simulate people, so that's why we decided to make a game where people play with each other. It's cost effective, it's elegant for us, but um, that just shouldn't stop people from trying to pursue those tools because who knows what, what we would make with them. I mean, maybe it wouldn't even be about proving you were so awesomely smart anymore. Maybe it would be about something else. Yeah, I think I'm in favor of experiences that invite play and structure play with other people at the same time, with other people at different times, and without other people. I, mean, I think those are all really exciting things to pursue. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm on the record enough about my opinion of <laughs> <laughs> um, So I think there are a lot of ways that games create meaning uh, without operational logics by simply borrowing from other genres, right? A, a cutscene in a game just uses sort of the, the tropes of film to communicate meaning. Um, and in this sort of vision of expanding games in terms of the procedural logics and the meanings they can express that way, is there a counterpoint of, well, we should also be investigating how this sort of jumble of older techniques, right, writing in games, film in games, um, with the unique interactivity of games, uh, should we also, like, is there a frontier there to push as well? Or is that sort of conquered territory and operational logics uh, are really the, the place to push forward? Isn't that kind of asking, like, if, you know, if, if the ingredients, garlic, tomatoes, olive oil, and salt are conquered territory? Like, I, that seems really, like, yes, the answer is definitely yes, we should totally do that. You might make something delicious with that that I've never eaten. Do it. But, I mean, I think, you know. <laughs> do it now. I think there's, 
from that sort of you know game studies perspective, at least I'm I, like I'm about to give a talk at Sarah Lawrence where I'm going to argue that um, like just what happens in Uncharted Two, right, where you kind of resent Jeff the cameraman and then he gets shot and you have to escort mission him, right? Like we still don't fully understand that combination of filmic techniques and gaming techniques, right? There's still a lot to think about and work with there. Um, so yeah, I definitely don't, uh, just like I wouldn't want to argue, as I was saying before, that um, you really shouldn't think about sound when thinking about film, right? Because it's, it's not the new thing in film. Um, you know, I, I definitely think that there's still a lot of work to do there, that like the first couple decades of game scholars have not nailed everything there is to think about. The, the game designers who've gone before have not done everything that could possibly be done. Um, but that's, um, that's not the only thing to do. And I, I'm afraid that sometimes we think it is. We have time for one more question, and then we're going to have a break. Yeah, um, my question is more about, uh, so each of you talk about making game design more broad, more accessible to a culture. And I guess my question is, do you think or what do you think the responsibilities of culture itself is to meet us halfway? Mm -hmm. Such as, um, I mean, when cell phones first came out, there were these bulky, expensive things that no one really liked. But as they became, and we moved process, and they got smaller and more affordable, it became the extraordinary, became ordinary itself to culture, and culture accepted it. Um, I mean, I, I don't think that necessarily you made, through design, you made cell phones extraordinary, ordinary. I don't think anyone as a culture could really go, wow, this is a little tiny talky thing. Because um, it was never around for thousands of years, never around. But I think culture accepted it and made it ordinary. So I guess the question is, do you think at what point does culture have to meet us halfway? Hmm. This is sort of a strange, it's, it's, on the one hand, it's a perfectly reasonable question. But on, on the other hand, it's, it's sort of strangely worded. I mean, the culture is not this thing that's out there, right, that we that we sort of see in the street and we have a, a conversation with. The, 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 there's this weird relationship that this sort of codependence between everything that everyone does and the things that people expect and want and desire and, and do. So I, I, don't, I don't know what to say other than that I think it's a murky, squishy mess instead of this kind of there are game makers or there are whatever makers and there are people and they're kind of negotiating as if, as if one of them is holding the other ransom. There's a sort of awful phrase in universities, which is, you know, progress in our field is being made in a series of funerals. Um, and I think there is, um, there is an unfortunate reality that the, the way things change is generational. Um, or maybe it's a fortunate reality, right? But I think, frankly, the, the, what is changing about the status of games is only in part the games we're making and how they're being distributed. And part of it is just that, like, you know, now the people who are game company executives and professors and so on grew up playing games, and that's just marching forward inevitably. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I wasn't, I personally wasn't trying to promote the idea of broadening by, by pointing out that, that those spectrum existed, but rather saying that it's just the, the case in general with things that are made by people, that as we continue to make them, they appeal to more people because we refine them and make them better, you know. Um, and then eventually they stop being appealing. Not everyone uses a fountain pen. They're kind of a pain in the ass. You know, if you like them, that's great for you. But, but uh, you know, games are in the phase right now where they're, they're blossoming out, and maybe at some point they'll become like opera or comic books. I mean, who knows? It, it seems like we've made it over that first period where we're really in danger of just being, you know, non-real or non-authentic or non-original. And now we are in that space where everyone can do it, and a lot of people just do. So it's rather than judge it, we should just examine it and understand it for what it is. And that I think that any area around those points is an interesting area to explore. And I, I have to admit it, I really do love those crazy, crazy, weird, non-accessible concepts. Um, my license plate is Katamari, so you know, <laughs> not a lot of people played it, but I still love it. It's still my favorite game because it was just totally game changing for that, for the people that got it. You know, that's okay. We should celebrate that and then be aware of. I think what what we're talking about is the reality and the needs of that reality. So I, I have a suggestion. Um, let's all agree 
that in this session we've solved the problem of the future of culture, okay? And when we reconvine, reconvene in half an hour to hear Will Wright in this room, everybody in the other room will be totally jealous that they didn't come to this session. <laughs> Let's thank our speakers. Thank you all for coming.